Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Saki, and we are still on site in San Jose at the American Anthropological Association's annual meeting. We are now sitting down with Dr. Daniel Ginsberg. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for coming on to the show. Yeah, sure. Greatly appreciate it. Daniel's awesome. He's got a great background. He's manager of education, research, and professional development at AAA. He's also an anthropologist in residence at American University in Washington, D.C. He got his PhD in linguistics from Georgetown. So, Daniel, I'd love to learn more about all of this from you. Let's start with how you even fell in love with anthropology in the first place. Yeah, that's, uh, it took me a while. I first thought of myself as an anthropologist in my fourth year of my grad program. Um, my background was in, I had, I had a previous career as a, as a school teacher, um, and I had decided I wanted to study linguistics. Um, so I started off studying applied linguistics, and that took me into sociolinguistics, and I was working in classrooms trying to figure out um, how students and teachers talk to one another and learn more about that. Um, so uh, eventually the way that took me was sort of into anthropology because I realized that if I was going to understand what was going on, I needed to understand the whole social setting of it. And it, it so happened that my advisor was actually a bona fide anthropologist, and so he brought me along. What were you learning about when you were learning about how teachers and students communicate? So my uh, research in grad school was on mathematics education. Um, I was really interested in how students learn to talk about math ah. and how they uh, think about themselves as being successful math learners or not. Because so many people have a hard time imagining themselves in that way. Um, and it was interesting to see the different ways that that came out um, through the ways that they talked in class and then the ways that they talked about it when I would interview them later. And how, how, what was the difference there? Um, so there's a couple of different uh, potential barriers that make it hard for people to see themselves in it. So the first one is if you think about, for a lot of people, math is a study of like X and Y, and it's hard to know if you don't know what X and Y actually are. Um, mm -hmm. You don't really relate to it and you don't see much purpose in it. Um, the second one is that there's this idea that math is the subject where there's always exactly one right answer, mm -hmm. which doesn't have to be that way. There are other ways of teaching math, but in a lot of cases, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. For a lot of students, that's what they like about it. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of other students, they'll say, look, if there's one right answer, if the teacher knows the right answer, what are you asking me for? Um, mm. And if I can't get it, then I just feel bad about myself. Mm. And then the third level is there's this idea of people will say, I'm not a math person. Mm -hmm. Right? Like you hear educated adults say, I'm not a math person, in the same way you would never hear them say like, oh, a book, well, I'm not a reading person, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the, people will say, oh, I can figure out the, the um, tip on our, on our restaurant bill, you figure it out. Um, and so I was really curious about what's behind that. And if there's an idea that some people are math people and some people are not, and if you're not, there's no way to become one, mm. then once you get that idea in your head, it's very difficult to figure out how to get there from here or even to care about it much. Those are really interesting points of analysis. I, I think the one right answer one's really interesting. The, if you already have the answer, why asking me? These are all very interesting. And also the not math person one. There's, there's this very strange, it's something that I've continuously explained to people when they say that, I don't really like math, I'm not a math person, which is that you do math all the time. You just don't know that it's math. Right. Like when you're crossing a sidewalk, you have to calculate well, how, how many seconds I have left until the crosswalk stop, and that, mm -hmm. like you're actually doing calculation. Can I walk fast enough to make it on time? Yeah. Et cetera, when you're driving, the same thing. What time do I need to leave for the airport? What time do I need to leave for the airport? All this different type of stuff. Yeah. So, okay, so then after that, how did you do the, you know, what was the thesis in linguistics and how did you get into you know, Georgetown to do that? Um, so I had been a, uh, a public school teacher. Like I said, in my last career, I was teaching English as a second language to um, students in a public high school outside of Boston. Um, so I worked there and I had studied um, comparative literature and math in my undergrad. So it came up at a certain time that uh, our students who were learning English, um, it was uh, teenage uh, immigrants and refugees. Um, there was sort of this idea that they didn't need particular help to learn math that they might need in English or science or US history. Um, but in a lot of cases, that wasn't really true. And so I realized that I could get my teaching license also in math and learn how to work with them and be able to work with them you know, within what the school would allow 
for us to be able to offer them linguistically appropriate mathematics instruction. Interesting. So I did that for two years, and it was really a struggle because the way that sort of best practices in doing that kind of work, as you say, for each lesson that I have, you know, students are going to learn this piece of math, and they're going to learn that piece of English, and it has to go together because it's one lesson. And I really struggled to figure out what would be an appropriate sort of language objective. Um, and I remember I asked, you know, we had an instructional coach and I asked her about it and she said, um, well, if you're, if you're doing, let's say for example, you're teaching students how to graph linear equations in the plane, then you could say students will learn the vocabulary of graphing linear equations in the plane, which it felt to me like a cop out, right? It's like there's more to it than vocabulary. Yeah. Um, but there wasn't really good science on what that was. Mm -hmm. Or if there was, it wasn't accessible to me as a high school teacher. You know, the education research that we were exposed to would be like somebody did a study with 50,000 kids and they tried a thing and it made a difference in their test scores. Um, and I really wanted something that I could recognize on the scale of I'm working with this group of 20 kids every single day um, rather than a huge group that I saw at one time. Um, so that's how I ended up also, I mean, interested in anthropology and ethnography because it really, it reads on that level of that a practitioner can recognize from their work experience. Um, but also it's how I got into the classroom discourse because I wanted to try and figure out like what, what is the language of math. Um, I had a job in between where I worked in uh, language testing and it was one of the standards that we worked on was um, we wanted to assess students' knowledge of the language of math and they didn't really have a good sort of concept of what that is precisely. Um, and so that was what took me into asking the questions that I asked in grad school. And so then a lot of then, is it, am I right that the linguistics analysis for you was in relation to how students learned math? It was. It was mostly what I was working with was video recordings that I made of math classes in session. Mm. Um, there are two classrooms where I was working. One was a, a middle school class for English learners, kind of like what I had been doing in my, in my previous career but with younger kids. Um, and the other was a, um, a college calculus section. Um, and so I would go in every once a week and video the entire class session and then I would take it home and transcribe it and do different kinds of analysis. And while I was there I would also take field notes because um, I found it was a really good way to keep myself keyed in and remember the kind of things that I was noticing and yeah. that I might want to follow up on later. Yeah. Whoa. So, so a lot of then the, the, what are some of the, I guess, the solutions then to uh, helping with the way that we speak about math? Mm. That's a great question, um, and I think it's important to think about how research feeds into practical solutions. Um, within the bounds of my grad program, I didn't really have space to do as much as I could have. Um, but what I became aware of a lot was that there were interesting points of intersection between what I was doing and what people were doing in math education. There's a lot of really sort of cutting edge work on trying to take down some of these same barriers to, to students seeing themselves as successful learners. So the one right answer thing. Um, there's a, there's a, a lot of work around that from people in, in mathematics education and the learning sciences. Um, so to give an example, like there are ways of asking the same question in a way that has multiple right answers, and then you can have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. um, so the example that I like to, to, to use is, I could ask you, if I have a rectangle that's four units by six units, what's the area? Mm -hmm. And then I'm asking you, can you multiply four by six and tell yeah. me what you get? Yeah. Or I can say, I have a rectangle that's 24 square units, what are the dimensions? Oh, interesting. And so then if I have one student says four by six <coughs> and one says six by four, then we can say, well, is that or is it not the same thing? Mm -hmm. If one student says four by six and one says three by eight, mm -hmm. and then we can say, could they both be right? Mm -hmm. And then once we've decided that they could both be right, we can say, well, how many right answers are there? How will you know when you've got them all? If you have one that's 48 by one half, does that count? Mm -hmm. And so then you can really get into a lot of that understanding and you sort of get around the, the one right answer thing that, that some people find to be a barrier. Um, that was a really good example. I like that one. Thanks. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, because in math, we're never, we were never taught what you just taught. I think maybe we were taught a 4 by 6 or 6 by 4 mm -hmm. but I don't think we were taught that it was all, that the purpose in so many ways was that in, in the way that you're describing the importance of it being that there is more than one right answer. Right. Yeah. And it's, it really gets you thinking more deeply as a teacher, right, about am I trying to get my kids to know how to find the right answer, or am I trying to get them to understand something about geometry on a deeper level than just like, can I solve, the, can I answer the question quickly? Yeah. Um, in a lot of sort of more traditional ways of teaching math, there's so much emphasis that's put on speed, 
you know, I remember as a kid having yeah. these sheets with like a hundred multiplication facts, and I had to see how many I could fill out. Yeah. Um, and some kids are good at that, and for ones who are not, it just makes them feel bad about themselves. And when you're actually doing math, like as a professional mathematician, it's not, it's not related to that at all. That's not the kind of thing they work on. And so one thing that's really interesting is to think about how you can make school math be more of an exploration in the way that professional you know, research pure math might be at an appropriate level. Yeah. Wow. That's a really cool point. So what, do you have another cool one that, that we could get better at with linguistics and learning, like with, with math or other subjects? One thing that I think about is there's a, there's a, a book that I was reading by a, uh, one of these math education people. Um, his name's uh, Christopher Danielson, and he, he wrote a, like a shapes book for kids where traditionally they're like, here's a triangle, and you ask your kid, like, oh, what is it? It's a triangle, okay. And so by the same token, like, that's not an interesting thing. And so his book, um, he's done a couple, but the first one was which one doesn't belong? And so it's, it's like a two by two, and you have four different shapes, and the question was which one of these shapes doesn't belong with the other three? Um, but the trick is, the way that he's designed it is it could be any of them. Oh, interesting. There's whichever three you pick, they have something in common that the other one doesn't have. Yeah, yeah. So they all look kind of similar. Right. It's okay. like shapes, so it could be like a triangle and three rectangles, but two of the rectangles and the triangle are shaded in, and the other rectangle is not, you know, is mm -hmm. this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I could say... Oh, so they have similar... Three of them have a similarity that one doesn't have. Right, right. Yeah. But whichever three you pick, they exactly. have some similarity. Yeah. And so then I guess it is linguistic, because then what happens is the point of it is not the answer. The point is the conversation that you have. Yeah. And the right answer, he says, the right answer is anything where your reasoning is true. Yeah. And so I'm not interested in did you, which one did you pick. I'm interested in how did you explain why you picked it. And that's, that's what really tells me cool. whether you picked the right one or not. Yeah. This is a proof. This is a th yeah. It's basically a proof, but it's a proof at a level that like six-year-olds can do it. Yeah, yeah, correct. That's so interesting. I like that example a lot, too. Wow. What a cool, what a cool way to apply uh, linguistics to uh, opening up the conversation around around mm -hmm. math and getting more people involved in and feeling like they have a, 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 a role to play in in math mm -hmm. okay now so now what is it like as you manage education research professional development at AAA what does that mean what does it look like mm. yeah that's I mean it's a lot it's it's a, it's a very long job title um, the reason that it's so long is that we, we were talking about me working on research and me working on education and me working on professional development. And we wanted to pick two out of three to make it a reasonable length. Um, but whichever one we left out, it's like which one doesn't belong. It's like yeah. whichever one we left out, it didn't quite hold together. And so we decided we needed to include the whole thing. Um, so the way it breaks down is the research is basically research on the profession of anthropology. So for the association, it's important for us to know things like how many people are studying anthropology in U.S. colleges and universities. Um, and what is that number? Do we know? <sighs> I should, shouldn't I? Um, it's like a couple tens of thousands? It's something in that, so at the undergraduate level it's in that range. And then I want to say um, maybe 1,500 master's degrees and 500 PhDs are granted a year, something in that something ballpark. In the ballpark, okay. Um, and maybe, maybe eight to 10,000 bachelor's degrees. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. But we, so we have like <laughs> resources, so we produce resources to, to, to share that kind of information with people. We also do like snapshots of this year of, of all the degrees that were granted, what part of the country were they granted in, how did the people who earned them um, break down according to gender and racial classifications, mm -hmm. um, because those are things that we can monitor to see how inclusive the discipline is and mm -hmm. start, you know, not because we want to ask everybody what race you are, because that's not really... Mm -hmm interesting or appropriate, but because we want to have ways of starting conversations about being more inclusive as a discipline. Totally. Um, uh, but we also, so we have research that we do on our own association members, um, just to know like what kind of jobs they're doing and uh, how they've arrived at where they're at and what they want to get out of the association um, and how they feel engaged with it. Um, we have a, a project that I'm really excited about because, you know, one question that comes up a lot is, what do you do with a, a bachelor's degree in anthropology? Um, Good question. Yeah, and uh, I've heard people say, you know, you can do whatever you want with it, which is true, but it's not helpful. 
So we want to try and find ways of giving more concrete specifics. And if there's anything that anthropology is good for, it's telling stories. Mm -hmm. So uh, this year, we're going to have a group of five, really six undergraduate research fellows. It's five, but one is a team of two. Um, who are going to be doing research on this topic at their own home institutions, um, working together uh, collaboratively online so they can sort of share the experience and support one another as they go through it. But the goal is for them, because they're really living it, but also that they can really dig into this question that's important to so many people about how do anthropology majors plan for what comes next after they graduate. Yeah. You know, on the one level, I can look at census data and say, you know, uh, there's so many thousands of people in the U.S. Census who report when they do the American Community Survey, they say, do you have a four-year degree? If so, in what? So they ask a certain number of people who have degrees in anthropology, and then they say, um, what sector of, of the economy is your job in, and what are your job responsibilities? And, and we can say, like, do some statistics and say, okay, anthropologists are way more likely to do a certain kinds of jobs that have to do with explaining culture to other people. So anthropology majors are more likely than others to be museum curators, um, social scientists, um, librarians, uh, and that's good on a certain level that we have those numbers, but we really also want to be able to tell the story and we want to bring the anthropology to that question um, and be able to talk about, you know, what was this process like for these students as they went through it? How did they talk about it amongst themselves? How did they imagine their future selves doing anthropology somewhere? And it's, it's like the math students, right? How do, they, how do they see themselves getting from here to there? Mm -hmm. So social scientists, librarians. Museum curators. Museum curators. Yeah. Nice. And there's there's this yeah. idea that if you're going to study anthropology, you're going to end up as a college professor because it's the only place to do it. But what we found looking at the statistical analysis of the census data is that anthropology majors are no more, I mean, they do do that some amount of the time, but they're no more likely to do it than any other liberal arts major. Oh. So it's not like anthropology is uniquely poorly supported for like other kinds of work. It just takes more effort to figure out for any individual person exactly what that is. Because it's so adaptable and, and like so broadly useful. Um, so we, cool we want to find ways of telling more success stories. That's what I was just about to say. It'd be cool to to get more anthropologists excited about telling stories that are relatable for the general public about how society has evolved or what certain what's certainly what's currently going on in certain yeah. geographic locations around the planet yeah. certain demographics around the planet so I love storytelling we love storytelling so if, if that could be something that um, you said so. There's there's these groups now that are um, six six of these individuals that are going at their local institutions mm -hmm. to do research on where mm -hmm. anthropology majors go for work. Mm -hmm. If we could funnel into into storytelling, that'd be great. Now, what what else is <clears throat> with uh, managing education, research, and professional development? Yeah. Right. What else? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the research piece. Okay. Um, and the research piece, like I said, it's important for us to know these things because people will call us up and say, you know. Um, in my department, we have had this and that change in the number of majors we have year over year. Does that mirror trends that are happening in the discipline more broadly? And we can talk about that. Um, but it's also important for us to be able to support professional development offerings that the association provides to its members. Um, and also for us to be able to support public education outreach initiatives for broader public. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, the professional development piece and the education piece, which I also work on. And then what does that look like for AAA to do outreach to the public? Um, it takes a lot of different forms. Probably the, the, the keystone example that we've had, the best example of successes that we've had doing that um, is a traveling museum exhibit that we had that was going around the country for the 10 years it's about to wrap up called Race, Are We So Different? Um, Interesting. And so this was... Traveling museum exhibits. Yeah. Cool. There was one, there was so much demand for it that they made a, a copy of it. Mm -hmm. And then there was still so much demand for it that they made a third copy of it that's smaller, that can fit into smaller spaces. Mm -hmm. And it draws from all different ways of doing anthropology to talk about, first of all, what is the science of human biological variation? And then the second thing is how, how is that used to classify people according to racial categories? Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is what... what um, ramifications does that have for the lived experience of people, you know, as they go through their lives and, and dealing with race in different ways or not. Um, and so the museum exhibit built in all of these things. Um, it's, it's just wrapping up a 10-year uh, run going all over the country. And then we also produced a number of, you know, there was a book. 10-year run. Yeah. 
we, we expected it to be less, and they keep, people kept asking for it. Um, there was a book. There Wait, was before a, we get into the book. Yeah. What was the the in, what were some of the interesting takeaways from like the, the variations and what that means about race? For race, are we so different? Um, so there are some really cool things that that came out as part of the materials that we used. So for example, what we did was we had a group of people who had um, T-shirts printed up where it would say at various points over the last hundred years or so, how would they have been classified racially on the U.S. Census? Mm. Because there's this sort of naive idea that race is this inherent thing of, of, of humans, that it's like, there's, you know, we just, anthropologists know there's no scientific biological basis for it. Um, there's not, you know, if you had a, if you had a sort of hypothetical Martian come and look at, at who people are just as animals, there's not like a different species that are white folks and black folks. That's not scientific. That's, that's social and it's, it's, it's racist thinking that then makes these categories. Um, but then you can go back and look at the... Interesting. So it goes under the umbrella of humans and not a specific yeah, genetic variation. Right. Yeah, right. Like there's yeah. more genetic variation within a race than there is from one race to another. You know? And so what it looks like on the, on the genetic level is that it's one species and it's very clear science. Um, but the other thing too with it being something that, that comes out of human society is that that is also a moving target. And so the way that people think about racial classification over time changes. Yeah, that and was so cool. And so we yeah, found a really cool way to illustrate that where we would have people wear a t-shirt that would say, you know, in, if I were alive in 1910, I would have been called this. Yeah. If I were alive in 1950, I would have been called that. And then when I filled out the 2010 census, I put this other thing. Yeah. And you can see that it's not the same thing from year to what year to year. What would be an example of what, how, how someone So, um, before the 1970s, we didn't really have an idea of Hispanic or Latino or Latinx, as people say now. Uh -huh. um, there was a census category. This wasn't in the race category. It was, um, and still the census asks about race and ethnicity separately. And so this is the ethnicity question is, are you Hispanic, Latino or not? Um, but this wasn't even a thing that they would ask about up until the 1970s. There were census designations for Spanish surname. Mm. Um, but there really wasn't a sense that um, people who are descended from uh, Latin American uh, countries or Latin American immigrants to the US um, would necessarily form a cohesive social group. And so there was really a social project in the 1970s to build that identity um, for US political purposes. And then it's interesting too that even now you can see when uh, migrants arrive in the U.S. from Latin America, they kind of have to learn to be Latinx because it's like before I was just Nicaraguan. And in Nicaragua, they might have other different ways of thinking about race that don't map neatly onto what we do. You're filling out a different census survey right. in Nicaragua than you are in the U.S. Right. And, and would I think of myself as being the same category as a Guatemalan or a Salvadoran or a Mexican or an mm -hmm. Argentine, mm -hmm. right? Just because we all speak Spanish. Yeah. But in the U.S., the politics of it is different, and so the classification is different. And it's something that's really come up pretty recently. That is so interesting. Whoa. <clears throat> yeah, the, how you can evolve over time. As, uh, so but we, we were really not even taking census surveys, really, of populations mm. prior to 1900, were we? I don't know how far, I mean, so the, it's in the Constitution that we do the, a census every 10 years. Okay. Um, so that we can figure out... Um, Who's living here? Or at how, wh wh where the congressional districts are going to be, how many representatives does each state get in Congress is proportionate to the population. population. And so it's in the Constitution that we have to count everyone um, every 10 years. So that goes back to the yes. 1790s. Um, That's why California has more votes than South Dakota. Right. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, but uh, the development of social science along with that over the last you know, hundreds of years, and, and so the, the US Census now does a lot more of that kind of work. Um, yeah. Interesting. And then the, the other thing you said was um, there's more genetic variation within a race than from a race to another race. Yeah. Interesting. So there's more genetic variation between two French people than there is between a French and like a South African person. Um, well, it's hard to look at it on the level of individuals, okay. right? Like how many genes do I have in common with you personally is... And this is, I'm getting way out of my area. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's better to tell This is so an exhibit. Yeah, yeah, this was in the exhibit. I just was finding the exhibit so interesting. And we have genetic anthropologists totally. here that I could hook you up with. That would be interesting. But my understanding of it is that if you look at the population as a whole, right, if, if there were, if races were a real scientific fact, then you would say, if I look at your DNA, that there would be like different 
trends where like all of these people's DNA is similar to each other and different from them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if you look at groups of people, it, it's, not, it's not the case. That's not how it is. Um, it's, it's that um, we have these racial groups that we've decided on because of culture and history. But if you look at the DNA of people within that group, they don't hang together as a unit in that way. They just look like human DNA. And so then this is part of the education piece. Right. And then is there another exhibit that's going up or what, you know, how does that yeah, look? Yeah, we're currently working on a successor. To, so we're, we're revising some of the race material. So I said it's, it's, it's been in the, um, in the field for 10 years. That means that it was first going out around the time that Barack Obama was elected president. And so if we're thinking about, you know, race and culture in the United States, there has been so much in the last 10 years. So we've been working on updating those materials to reflect a lot of what's happened since then, from Obama to Black Lives Matter to a lot of other things that have come out. Um, and at the same time as that, because the, the museum exhibit is winding down, we're also starting to ramp up another thing, um, which is called World on the Move, 100,000 Years of Human Migration. Yeah, that sounds cool. Yeah, so we have done... We're, we're, we're still working on um, finding the resources to put together the museum exhibit for that. Um, but we've done uh, some writing in, in our own. So in Anthropology News is our member newsletter, and we've had a series of articles about migration under that heading. Um, we have a collaboration that we've done over a number of years with the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, where they put on a, a, the Folklife Festival on the National Mall every year. And we've had uh, presence there working on... It's all always ties in with migration in some way, mm -hmm. because they bring in... Um, cultural heritage performers from around the world. And so then it's been a real great opportunity for us to have conversations about that um, and uh, in collaboration with such a good partner. What does 100,000 years of migration look like? Um, what are you guys going to be showcasing? There's, there's a lot of different angles on it, and so we're still working through a lot of the details, but there is sort of the long view story that you can tell of how the, the human species began in, in East Africa and now populates you know, the entire world. How did that happen? And, and what is the evidence that we use to tell that story? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you can tell the story in terms of DNA, you can tell it in terms of bones, you can tell it in terms of uh, cultural practices and food. Mm -hmm. um, you can tell it in terms of language. Um, you, can, you can find artifacts that, that show how um, culture was shared between people from here to here to here. And so it brings together all different ways of doing anthropology to tell that story in the long term. Mm -hmm. But then there are also more micro stories that you can tell about specific instances of, you know, in this place, um, who lived here and then who came here? Why did they come? Where did they come from? And what happened to the people who are already there? Yeah. Um, and there are, there are, that story has happened in a lot of ways in a lot of places over the last 100,000 years. And we're still working out exactly what that's going to look like when we um, build it out. Um, but that's, that's the kind of stories that we're looking to tell. Oh man, there's yeah, there's so many variables to calculate for this story of the hundred thousand years of migration, and and I like I like all the angles that you want to take on it. That's that's the way to do it. Now, um, I want to ask you about what's going on with the anthropologist in residency at American University in Washington D.C. Because I the A AIR the anthropologist in residence is so interesting. So like, what is that like? This is a brand new thing um, that I've just been, been doing recently. It's, it's, um, my goal was never to be a college professor, even though I got my PhD. I was just interested in doing this kind of research and figuring out um, how to ask these questions and go through it in a, in a rigorous way and find satisfying answers to difficult questions. Um, and it's something that I've been able to do, you know, working at a nonprofit. You know, the AAA is a nonprofit. Um, but there's a lot of reasons why it's also good to maintain contacts with academic institutions. So part of it is that, thinking of it from the association perspective, so many of our members work on higher education, either as professors or graduate students. Um, and so uh, it's good for me to just be in touch with that world on a professional level as well as on a sort of member services or, or conceptual, you know, reading about it kind of level. Um, and so this gives me a kind of an academic home base where I can have um, professional colleagues mm -hmm. that I can support. So for example, I've, I've done a... Uh, guest lecture in, in classes where people are teaching things that intersects with what I know. Mm -hmm. um, to give you an example, there's a, there's a course that they're teaching now called Craft of Anthropology, where um, students learn theory and method in a project-based way. Mm -hmm. And so they're working with uh, a community near Washington, D.C. They're doing some uh, 
I think some archaeological work and also oral histories. Mm -hmm. And for me coming into it with a background in linguistics, my question is, once you've taken that oral history interview, what do you do with it? Yeah. How do you think about what people are saying to you and, and interpret that? And so I went in and taught a, a sort of a mini workshop on how to look at narrative. Um, there's this idea that, you know, when you do oral histories, people tell you stories. And there are ways of thinking about a story as, you know, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and usually there, when you get to the end of it, there's some like, here's why I told you that story. Um, and so you can look at it in a structural way of what are the stages of it, yeah. but you can also look at it in a functional way. Why are people telling stories? Yeah, yeah. Um, what kind of world are they constructing? So if I'm telling a personal narrative, it's a story about me, and I'm building this story world where I'm a certain kind of a person dealing with other kinds of people in a certain way, and that is presenting a kind of like my interpretation or representation of a, a social reality. Um, and so for me, looking at the transcript as an analyst, I can pull all of these things out. But there's another level to it, too, where by me telling you a story, I, in this real life world, have decided to tell you this story in this way for some reason. Yeah. And that tells me something about who I am in the story world, but it also tells me something about who I am in this world right now of the storytelling world. Mm -hmm. um, and what's going on in this interview interaction? Mm -hmm. uh, how am I thinking about participating in oral history? Yeah. How, am I, how am I trying to represent you know, my heritage to this researcher today. Yeah. Um, and so uh, what I was offering in that setting was I have the, the analytic tools to be able to look at these things um, and, and talk it through in a way that really complements cultural anthropology in, in exciting ways. Yeah, that's a really good way to look at, you know, why is someone telling a certain a story the way that they're telling it about themselves, oral history. Mm -hmm. and. And I, I look forward to the work that you end up doing as an anthropologist in residence and um, the continued work. Thank you for the continued work at uh, AAA. Mm -hmm. this, yeah, this is an incredible place and I feel very much like a kid in a knowledge haven right now. It's Thanks, that's fun. great to hear. Yeah, it's super fun. Daniel, thank you for joining us on the show. Yeah. It's been a huge pleasure talking yeah, to you. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. And thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Give us your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. Um, also, go ahead and check out AAA. The link's in the bio. And much love, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. And go and build the future. Manifest your destiny into the world, everyone. Peace. <laughs>